Number 1. McClurkin was last seen in the 1000 block of South Washington Street in Kokomo, Indiana on October the 11th, 2016. She left her wallet and identification behind and has never been heard from again. It's been nearly five years since Karina McClurkin went missing and to this day no one knows what happened to her. At the time of her disappearance she was 18. Jerry McClurkin is Karina's grandmother. She wants to know what happened to her granddaughter. The last words I heard my granddaughter tell me when I asked her to move in with me was, I'll be okay, ma'am or McClurkin explained. A missing persons report for Karina was filed on October the 12th, 2016. She was last seen in the 1000 block of S. Washington Street. She walked into a house on S. Washington, the 1000 block, and she never walked out supposedly McClurkin said. In the past four years, investigators say they've pursued numerous leads, but they found nothing. They believe this investigation can be resolved. They're asking if anyone knows something say something. I still see girls walking today that remind me of Karina. I will physically stop my car, back up and look at them to see if it's her, but it's not McClurkin explained. Jerry has had many sleepless nights waiting for answers. She believes her granddaughter is dead. This week, a group of volunteers helped McClurkin search for Karina's remains in local ponds. They thought they'd found something but came up empty-handed. My son stood up and walked away and went down on his knees. All I could do is stand there and pray, but it was just a tire and a log McClurkin said. Jerry admits her granddaughter had a drug problem and ran around with the wrong people. This doesn't mean she wasn't important to the family. She wanted to come clean. She was a good kid. She really was McClurkin said. Jerry hopes another four years doesn't go by without any answers, because the family wants closure. The Kokomo Police Department continues to ask for the community's assistance in locating Karina McClurkin. Anyone with any information that they believe may be helpful in locating Karina McClurkin is asked to contact Sergeant Richard Benzinger at 765-456-7324 or the Kokomo Police Department hotline at 765-456-7017. You may qualify for a cash reward by calling Central Indiana Crime Stoppers at 1-800-262 tips with your anonymous tip. Number 2. An Amber Alert was cancelled for 11-year-old Breja Terrell, who went missing in Davenport just over six months ago. Terrell was reported missing July 10 after spending the night with her half-brother at the house of his father, Henry Dinkins, in the 2700 block of East 53rd Street in Davenport. Dinkins is in custody on sex offender registration violations and has been named a person of interest in the case, but he has not been named a suspect. On July the 15th, an Amber Alert was issued. But on Wednesday, the Amber Alert was cancelled. Mitch Mortvert of the Iowa Division of Criminal Investigation told the register it was cancelled because there is no longer an immediacy factor. There's no new information that led to the cancellation, just basically the time factor, Mortvert said. Mortvert cited Iowa's qualifications for Amber Alerts, which according to the state's Amber Alert website, are as follows. Law enforcement confirms a child has been abducted, and entry has been made into the Iowa-NCIC systems identifying the child as missing. The child is under the age of 18. Law enforcement believes the circumstances surrounding the abduction indicate that the child is in danger of serious bodily harm or death. There is enough descriptive information about the child, abductor, or suspect's vehicle to believe an immediate broadcast alert will help. Although the Amber Alert is cancelled, the missing persons investigation is still ongoing, Mortford said. Aisha Langford, Terrell's mother, said she didn't know the Amber Alert was being cancelled or why until a register reporter contacted her. Langford told the register she has questions and concerns regarding the cancellation. It doesn't make any sense, just because there isn't information coming from the Amber Alert. She isn't home. It's been six months, 186 days, and counting, Langford said. Davenport police say Terrell, who is 4 feet 5 inches tall, weighs about 75 pounds and has brown eyes and black hair, was last seen near Dinkin's apartment in the early hours of July 10. She was wearing a white t-shirt, shorts and sandals when she went missing. Davenport police are asking anyone with information about Dinkins' whereabouts from 10 p.m. on July the 9th through noon on July the 10th to come forward. 
and they're seeking information about vehicles associated with Dinkins during that time frame, including a maroon 2007 Chevrolet Impala, a black 2012 Chevrolet Camro and a motorhome. The Federal Bureau of Investigation Office in Omaha, Nebraska, is offering the $10,000 reward for information leading to Terrell's return, which is separate from a $3,500 reward offered by the Quad Cities Crime Stoppers. The National Center for Missing and Exploited Children has been assisting Davenport Police as well. John Biskoff, vice president of the organization, emphasized that as time goes on, it is more important than ever to highlight Terrell's case in the media, share her photo, and make sure that Avonport community and beyond knows she is still missing. Law enforcement, the National Center and the family are working feverishly to find Terrell safe, Biskoff previously told the Register. Don't give up hope on Bree just because days, weeks or months have gone by. There's always going to be hope that we will find her safely. Number 3 Detrick Foster, an Independence Kansas man who hasn't been seen or heard from since mid-April, has missed several holidays and important occasions, and his family is worried. He never called his mother on Mother's Day. He missed spending Father's Day with his two daughters, and missed both of their birthdays. He missed celebrating his 38th birthday with his twin sister in June. Three months have passed, but Detrick's family continues to search for him, hoping someone with information will come forward. Jordan Foster, Detrick's former wife and the mother of his children, told Dateline it's uncharacteristic for Detrick to not be in contact with the family. He would never just disappear, Jordan said. Not from his family. Not from his children. They're everything to him. This is not like him. Jordan, who lives in Kansas City, with the couple's daughters, ages 5 and 13, said she last spoke to Detrick on April the 4th. He called me to let me know his phone, it's a prepaid phone, would be shut off soon Jordan said. But that wasn't anything unusual. A couple days would pass and he'd have a new phone. But he always called. He always told me, or his mother or sisters, where he'd be. But Detrick never called. As weeks passed, Jordan said she was slightly concerned that their normal pattern of communication had changed, but did not become really worried, until Detrick failed to call his own mother on May the 10th, Mother's Day. He always calls his mother, his sister and myself on Mother's Day, Jordan said. And he's really close to his mother. When he didn't call her, we knew something was wrong. The family started making calls and when they figured out that no one had seen or heard from Detrick since mid-April, they filed a missing persons report with the Independence Police Department. According to Independence Police Chief Jerry Harrison, there are various reports from friends who said they saw Detrick in mid-April in the Independence area, but police said they believe the last confirmed sighting of Detrick was on April the 12th in Independence, Kansas. Chief Harrison would not share any further details on the case, and told Dateline it is still an open investigation. This is still an open investigation, and we are still actively pursuing leads, Chief Harrison said. Several agencies in this area are working on the case, and it's a top priority for us. Jordan told Dateline that the family, who live in Parsons, Kansas, spent days posting missing person flyers around the Independence area, where Detrick lives. But shortly after, the flyers were taken down, leading Jordan to question the community's sincerity in finding Detrick. She added that a friend who lives in Independence has since reposted some of the flyers. I believe someone in independence knows something, but no one is speaking up, Jordan said. We just need that person to come forward with any information that could help us find Detrick. Jordan has known Detrick since she was 15 years old. She said Detrick grew up in Parsons, Kansas, and graduated from Parsons High School. He had previously worked as a corrections officer and tactical private security officer, which led to a lot of traveling for work. But Jordan said Detrick always called to check in on his daughters, and never failed to miss important occasions. Detrick is the type of guy who would just drop everything to help someone, Jordan said. When he'd come to visit the girls, he'd help me with things around the house. Jordan told Dateline that Detrick had been between jobs in April due to the COVID-19 pandemic, but said he had landed a job at FedEx right before he disappeared. Jordan, who stays in constant touch with Detrick's family, said the family is not willing to speculate on the details of his disappearance, as it is still an ongoing investigation. All I can say is, we fear the worst, Jordan said. The family is having a tough time right now. The fact that no one in Independence is speaking up is worrisome and frustrating. She added that it's also hard to believe that someone would harm Detrick. As far as I know, he doesn't have any enemies, Jordan told Dateline. He's very social and has lots of friends. 
Our oldest daughter is just like him, a social butterfly. As Dedrick's daughters continue to ask where he is, Jordan holds on to hope that she can one day give them good news. Dedrick was 37 years old when he disappeared in April. He would have turned 38 in June. He is described as being 5'9 tall, weighing 190 pounds, and has black hair and brown eyes. If you have information that could help the case, contact the Independence Police Department at 620-332-1700 or the Kansas Bureau of Investigation at 785-296-4017. Number 4. Andrea Nabel has been missing since 2019, and flyers with her face still cover light poles across Metro Louisville. Now, 17 months since she first disappeared, her family remains determined to keep her name known, back out on Louisville streets, to remind the community she is still missing. Andrea Nabel was last seen alive, before going missing on August 13, 2019. Her family, still without answers about what happened to her, held a vigil Sunday in her honor. We sought to pray for her, to create hope, to pray for the many many other families in crisis we've come across over the last nearly year and a half, Andrea's father, Mike, said. The single mother of two, 37 years old when she went missing, was last seen heading from her sister's home to her mother's home in an Audubon Park neighborhood. I know that Andrea would be out there helping anyone who is missing, so I wanted to make sure I'd do my best for her, and help to find out what happened and bring her back safely, Andrea's sister Erin, said. Mike said Sunday that Andrea's case is still active, with a potential sighting of her within the last three days. He said most of the sightings the family learns about are outside of the Louisville area. We're still looking. We thought it was a credible sighting. The private investigators are looking, he said. Nabel's family previously told us they don't believe Andrea voluntarily walked away, but at this point they don't know if she's still alive. They're holding out hope that she is. If Andrea is still alive, her family hopes she hears their message and pleas for her to return home. We don't care where you've been, what you've done, what kind of trouble you're in or not, it doesn't matter to us. You're my daughter, we love you, we would welcome you home with a celebration, Mike said. While the search continues, the now second annual vigil in Andrea's honor aims to also bring hope to other families of missing individuals. The thing that we fear the most is that with the time passing she'll be forgotten so making sure that we're taking action, Erin said. With an outpouring of support from the community as the Nabal family searches. They said that's what has kept them going. We feel it, it strengthens us, and I think I myself would be a puddle on the pavement right now without it, Mike said. The family encourages anyone with information to come forward, saying tips from the public and the power of social media have helped in trying to track Andrea down. Number 5. Katie Harsh's family has been going to Kentucky's Grayson Lake for years. The man-made lake and its surrounding woods are an area her family knows so well, she said, that they continued to visit even after her father Richard Lee was diagnosed with dementia in 2015. My dad knew that area and he knew the lake, Katie said. He had basically a triangle of the area that he would pace which consisted of where the boat was docked, straight through the parking lot all the way to the bathroom, and then he would walk the tree line, and it would circle back down to the boat. On September the 3rd, 2018, Katie says she, her husband, and their children were at the Wheeling, West Virginia home they shared with her parents, Richard and Leslie. Richard and Leslie had gone down to Grayson Lake to spend time with Katie's brother, Jacob, on his pontoon. On that particular day, they had all gotten off the boat Katie said she would later learn. And my dad, for some reason, went outside of his normal pacing zone. When my brother caught up to him, he was practically out of the parking lot. So my brother started walking him back to the boat. On their way back to the boat, Katie told us that her father spotted his wife, Leslie, and went over to her. Seeing his father was safe with his mother, Jacob went back to the boat while his parents took his kids to the playground. They got to the playground and my dad started walking around it. And every time he walked around it, the circle would get bigger. My mom would yell for him, and he would come back, Katie told us. But the last time she yelled for him, he just ignored her and kept walking. According to Katie, before Leslie could gather her grandchildren and go catch up to her husband, Richard had walked out of sight. It was around 6.30 p.m. instantly, my mom, brother, and sister-in-law started to look for my dad. They saw a park ranger and gave a description to them, and they immediately started looking Katie said. Katie says her father, who has been nonverbal for the past year, did not have a cell phone, ID, or credit card on him at the time. 
there was no way to track him, and the family immediately grew concerned. Katie says that state and local agencies arrived that evening to help search for Richard. They searched for him until 3 o'clock in the morning, Katie said. Canine units followed his scent up to the road, but then they lost him. Shortly after that initial search, Carter County EMA director Jeremy Rogers told local NBC affiliate WSAs at his concerns. It's tough here. Number one, we're dealing with the lake itself. Then we're dealing with undergrowth once you get into the tree line, things of that nature. There's just this vast area we're trying to cover because we don't have a great exact direction of travel, so we're having to search a large area around the lake, and Marina Director Rogers said. It's dangerous for searchers who are packing bottles of water with them, let alone someone who is out and doesn't have any access to fluids. Two days after Richard disappeared, the Carter County Sheriff's Office wrote in a Facebook post that the search for Richard had been scaled back. He is now considered a missing person. All resources have been exhausted. County M used search dogs, helicopters, ground pounders, divers, sonar, ATVs, firefighters, law enforcement, fish and wildlife, volunteers, and agencies outside and in Carter County the post read. Richard's daughter Katie says the case has since been moved to the Kentucky State Police, who had not replied to Dateline's request for comment by Monday evening. We haven't even found a shoe, let alone a shirt or his hat that he had on. Nothing Katie said, adding that her family has a few ideas on what could have happened that day near the lake. One of our theories is that somebody picked him up. But he hasn't been dropped off at a hospital, nursing home, or police station. We also thought that maybe somebody took him in. But that's a full-time job to take care of him. Regardless of what happened to her father, Katie says she and her family are desperate for answers. He's not even on camera passing a local business. It's like he just disappeared. We need closure. We need something, she said. Richard Lee is described as being 5'6 tall and weighing 140 pounds. He was last seen wearing a tan shirt, blue cotton shorts, gray shoes and a camouflage hat with a P on it. If you have any information on Richard's whereabouts, please contact the Kentucky State Police at 606-928-6421. Number 6. Sperry was last seen in Graves County, Kentucky on March the 28th, 2018. She and her boyfriend, Ren Lee Hendrickson, got into a verbal altercation in the 4200 block of Tim Road. Hendrickson decided to take Sperry's car back to her home to spend the night, and Sperry left with his father, Dusty Holder, on a four-wheeler. Photos of Hendrickson and Holder are posted with this case summary. Holder later said he and Sperry got lost after the four-wheeler got stuck in the mud and then ran out of gas. They spent the night in the woods and began walking out the next morning. The two of them came out of the woods at the Kayla Bottoms by the bridge near Highway 131 and Highway 849. They were cold, wet and tired. He suggested they walk to the Kayla Mar to warm up and get something to eat, but Sperry told him she was going to a relative's house. They parted ways, Holder went to the Kayla Mart, and she was last seen walking toward Highway 849. She never showed up for her 9 p.m. shift at work, and has never been heard from again. That evening, after Holder told Hendrickson what happened, Hendrickson called his mother and told her he had taken pills and was going into the woods to die. The next morning, police launched a search for both him and Sperry. Her car was found abandoned at the intersection of Highway 131 and Dooms Chapel Road, south of Simsonia, Kentucky. Authorities found Holder's four-wheeler during a ground search. There was only one set of footprints around it, and one set of footprints leading out of the woods. Investigators also found two cellular phones, both of which belonged to Holder, in the ashes of a small fire. They stated the evidence at the scene didn't match Holder's story, and there was no sign that Sperry had ever been in the vicinity. Hendrickson resurfaced on April 1, when he went to Holder's house, dehydrated and hypothermic, and asked for assistance. He was taken to the hospital for treatment. A photo of him is posted with this case summary. In his account to police, he stated he'd taken items belonging to Sperry and to himself into the woods, and had lost them. These items were never recovered. Both Holder and Henriksen were questioned multiple times about Sperry's disappearance, and both men passed polygraph tests about it. Sperry's sister doesn't believe she got lost in the woods prior to her disappearance, as she had lived in the area her whole life, and was very familiar with the woods. Police later found blood in Sperry's home and her vehicle, and sent it to a lab for analysis. 
She was separated from her husband at the time of her disappearance, and they shared joint custody of their children. Her family fears Sperry became a victim of foul play, but the circumstances of her disappearance are unclear. Her case remains unsolved. Number 7. Gary was last seen at her apartment in the 8300 block of Airline Highway in Baton Rouge, Le Jeune, on December 27, 1988. She called her sister that day and said things weren't working out, and she wanted to move back to Shreveport, Louisiana, where she'd lived before. She has never been heard from again. In the first week of January, Gary's apartment manager called her sister to say the rent was due, and Gary was into answering the door. The manager left herself inside the apartment and found the lights and coffee maker on. The bathtub had been filled with water, and there were two cups on the bar. Gary's driver's license, purse and car keys were in the bedroom. A packed suitcase was on the bed, and family photos were spread across the bed. The manager wanted to put Gary's belongings out in the street, because the rent hadn't been paid, but her sister asked her not to until the police came to investigate. When the manager checked a few weeks later, the lights were off, but the suitcase and photographs were still on the bed. The rest of her clothes were hanging in the closet, and her car was parked in the parking lot. An autographed photograph of Louisiana Governor Edwin Edwards was found torn up on a counter in her home. Gary has never been heard from again. The police never did come to the apartment, and eventually Gary's brother went there to collect her things. She was reported as a missing person on January the 20th, 1989, three and a half weeks after she was last seen. Gary's daughter, Jamie Williams, believes Edwards was involved in her mother's disappearance. She claims Gary was obsessed with Edwards, and that the two of them had had an affair. Gary reportedly was planning to end the affair at the time she went missing. When he was questioned about Gary, Edwards said he had no involvement in her disappearance, and also denied having had a romantic relationship with her. His office did turn over several letters Gary had written him. In 2001, Edwards was convicted of unrelated charges of racketeering, money laundering and conspiracy, and sentenced to 10 years in prison. Gary was employed as a waitress at the time of her disappearance. She lived with Williams and was raising her alone, her daughter's father was not a part of their lives. Gary had insisted Williams take a bus to spend the 1988 Christmas holidays with relatives in Shreveport. They had an argument about it at the bus station. This is the last time Williams saw her mother. Authorities described Gary's disappearance as suspicious. They stated her apartment appeared as if she had been packing to go somewhere and had been interrupted. For about a year prior to going missing, Gary had carried a large manila envelope. She hid it under her bed and told her mother that if anything happened to her, her relatives should open the envelope and examine the contents. The envelope was missing from Gary's apartment after she vanished. Williams is still searching for her mother, and believes there is a possibility that she left voluntarily in 1988 and is still alive. Gary's case remains unsolved. Number 8 Latilis was last seen on the Interstate 10 bridge over the Mississippi River in Baton Rouge, Louisiana on August 29, 2014. He was sitting along the bridge rail next to his pick truck. Someone spoke to him at 2 a.m., and he said he was en route to West Baton Rouge, but it never arrived there. The last time somebody talked to him was around 2 o'clock that morning, says Baton Rouge Police Detective Robert Cook. He said he was headed to West Baton Rouge. He never made it, of course. Back in the early morning hours of August the 29th, 2014, police say they got an anonymous call from someone saying they saw somebody jump off the bridge. The RPD in the East Baton Rouge Sheriff's Office spent the next couple of days searching the river, but no body ever turned up. Jake's mother, Tina Dupy, has a very different idea about that evening. I don't think he put that truck there. I think that was a cover-up for whatever happened to my son, she says. It's been more than a year, and nothing has turned up. The investigation into what happened is pretty much at a standstill without a new lead. Anything is possible at this point, says Detective Cook. But without any information to make us believe anything happened other than him jumping, we're kind of at a dead end. Jake's mother says that information is out there. She believes something much more sinister happened early that morning. She went to her son's trailer later on that day, and says what she found really scared her. When I got there, a window was punched out, there were holes in the walls. His personal items were missing. TV, guns, everything. There is also one more thing that just isn't sitting well with her. 
Her son had a broken foot and used crutches to get around. Those can't be found either. If he jumped off the bridge, his crutches would have been in his room, at his house, in his truck, on the bridge. They would have been somewhere, she says. The Mississippi River is not quick to give up its secrets, if indeed it has any in this case. So the mystery remains for a mother and her family. Did Jake jump off of the bridge and fall 175 feet to the water below? Or is there something else going on here? Without any help, the answer may still be a long way off. Number 9. February 2016 was a busy time for Russell Burnett. His daughter was planning a birthday party for him, he had also recently found out about a second son, and was spending a lot of time with him. He had friends to hang out with, and dog, BV, to pet. February 2016 was also a difficult time for Russell Burnett. Both of his parents had cancer, and the anniversary of his 20-year-old son's death was approaching. According to his friend Kelly Young, Russell, 48, was scared to be alone. Kelly frequently took meals to Russell and his dog BV. I loved him like a kid brother. I can't see Russell or his dog BV starve, Kelly told us. We lived about half a mile from each other. I usually saw him every day, or every other day. On Sunday, February 19, 2017, Kelly went over to Russell's house in Franklin, Maine. The pair liked to watch the sitcoms Big Bang Theory and Two Broke Girls together. Russell was not in his right mind, Kelly told us, describing Russell that Sunday night. Very odd behavior. Russell's cousin Kim Wilbur told us that the next day, Russell and BV visited his neighbor Terry Casper's house, Russell and BV ended up staying the night on the couch. In the morning, Terry woke up and Russell got up, too. He was supposed to meet someone to take him to the doctor Russell's cousin Kim told us. So he and Bev left. Terry says she watched them walk through the woods back toward Russell's house. But three hours later, when Russell's ride showed up to take him to the doctor, Russell and BV were nowhere to be found. His cell phone, cell phone charger, Bible and the jacket he had had on were all found at his house, Kim said. After waiting a few days to see if Russell would come home, Russell's cousins reported him missing to the Hancock County Sheriff's Office. The Hancock County Sheriff's Office did not reply to Dateline as of Monday afternoon. I called the search and rescue crew, Kim told us. They came down from Moore North in Maine, and they brought three cadaver dogs. They didn't charge us anything to do it. Kim said the dogs sniffed Russell's belongings in his house, and then spent the entire day in the woods. It was February in Maine, though, so the low temperatures and gusty winds halted the ground search. Kim told us Russell didn't have any bank accounts, so there was no way to track him. We had helicopters, we had search parties but found nothing. It went on for weeks. We've looked in people's boats, sheds, vehicles you just never know where someone is, Kim said. There was a big crunch at the beginning because it was so cold. We needed to find him, because otherwise he would die. All searches were fruitless. There was no sign of Russell or his dog BV. Until two weeks after Russell vanished, that is, when his neighbor Terry spotted a familiar furry friend in her front yard. BV showed up two weeks later at the neighbor's house looking totally fine, Kim told us. He was fed, happy and rolling around in the yard. It's the strangest thing. BV was washed, well fed, no broken nails, no dander, she was a kept dog, Kelly said. If she was out in the woods with Russell, she would have been skinny, dirty and lifeless. Whoever had BV pampered her. Kelly said Russell and BV never left each other's side. But Russell never came home. The case recently got transferred from the Hancock County Sheriff's Office to the Maine State Police Department, but Kim said the search efforts have largely dissipated. Russell's cousin told us that as the anniversary of Russell's disappearance approaches, she no longer believes he is alive. At this point, he is probably playing baseball in heaven. Russell would never go anywhere for a period of time without being in touch with his family, Kim said. He was a very loving, compassionate person. He cared about people. He had his problems, but he was harmless. Although she no longer watches her favorite shows with her friend, Kelly said she thinks about him constantly. Like Willie Nelson sings, you are always on my mind, Kelly told us. I would tell my friend, you are not forgotten. You are loved, and BV misses you. Russell Burnett is described as being 5'7 and weighing 150 pounds with hazel eyes. He has a shaved head and a blonde beard. If you have any information on Russell's disappearance, please call the Maine State Police at 207 to 973 to 3700 and ask to speak with Sergeant Darrell Perry. Number 10. 
Joanna and her daughter Sherry's Clark disappeared from Baltimore, Maryland on February 4, 2017. Sherius was last seen babysitting that afternoon, and Joanna was last seen later that evening between 11 p.m. and midnight. Joanna was 33 years old when she went missing, and Sherius was just 15. Joanna and her daughter Sherius were last seen on February 4, 2017 in Baltimore. Both disappeared that same day, but at different times. That day, while her mother was at work, Sherius was babysitting her six younger siblings at home, located in the 2800 block of Round Road in the Cherry Hill neighborhood of South Baltimore. Authorities believe Sherius disappeared late in the afternoon, after she was done babysitting. According to the Baltimore Police Department, her last known communication was at 2.30 p.m. That same evening Joanna is believed to have been out with friends. Her last known communication was between 11 p.m. and midnight, according to police. It is unknown whether she made it home. Joanna's family believes that her ex-boyfriend and the father of her six younger children, Dennis Queen, had something to do with their disappearance. The pair had a 13-year relationship, and months before she disappeared Joanna got a protective order against him. Queen denies any involvement in their disappearance. There hasn't been any activity on Joanna or Sherius's cell phones or social media since they went missing. Sherius didn't have a history of running away, and according to her family, it's unimaginable that Joanna would leave her children. Authorities have not named a suspect in the case, but they do suspect the pair was met with foul play. Their cases remain unsolved. Joanna Clark is a Caucasian female born on August 10, 1983. She stands 5'3", weighs 140 pounds, and has brown hair and brown eyes. Her lip and ears are pierced. Joanna has several tattoos, the name Cato on her left arm, the name Trey on her right arm, the name Sherius on her back, a butterfly near her neck, a heart on her chest, and a lion's head on her lower right leg. Sherius Clark is a biracial, Caucasian-slash-African-American, female born on November 19, 2001. She stands 5'4", weighs 130 pounds, and has black hair and brown eyes. Her nose and ears are pierced. If you have any information regarding the disappearance of Joanna and Sherius Clark, please contact the Baltimore City Police at 410-396-2525.